Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and today I am super excited to have with me on the line uh, Pekka Takala, and he is in Oulu, Finland. And uh, let's uh, let's pop on over. We're going to do something special. We're going to get out on the bike with Pekka. So here we are. <laughs> Pekka, thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be fun. Oh yeah, welcome, John. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. Well, uh, before we get started on a little bit of a ride, because you're going to take us for a little tour, uh, why don't you just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, so as you said, I'm Pekka Tahkola from the city of Oulu, Finland, very well pronounced there. So lots of lots of time people get that wrong saying Oulu or something. It's Oulu. Yeah. Anyway, so I've been working here in Oulu uh, as a cycling coordinator for the city from 2013 to 2019. And nowadays I work on various projects regarding bicycle transportation, such as these bicycle superhighways and counters and guidance and other uh, projects that have to do with wise mobility so making people move that move about using their own muscle power fantastic i love it i love it and uh, and and you were great because you, uh, you 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 let me know early on that you you had this desire to do something different a little bit fun and get out of the studio and uh, the only thing that i'm a little jealous about is i can't be out there on the bike with you <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should. And in case you have the option, last of September, 1st of October, we are arranging the biggest uh, bicycle conference in the Nordic countries here in Oulu called Velo Finland. So if you just have the chance, please come. Ah, and I don't have the chance because I'm going to actually be uh, heading, heading to the Netherlands uh, at the end of October for the International Cargo Bike Festival. But uh, next year. Yeah, next that's year. a promise. Okay, very good. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, we, we sort of set this up, so let's uh, let's get out and do some riding. Yeah, let's do that. All right, well, go so, ahead and kick us off. Let's do that. So, Pekka, while you're right there at your bike, why don't you swing back around and take a look at that counter yeah. Uh, yeah, and, sure. uh, and, and tell us a little bit about what we're looking at right here. So here we have one of our counters it counts both people walking and people cycling here and it also displays the top three of our other counters. So currently we have about 10 or 11 of these installed. These were uh, developed speci specifically for Oulu and in Oulu for our conditions. So these are weatherproof 60 inch uh, screens where we can display anything we want. So traditionally, bicycle counters have had like a huge area of like statistic display to show how many people cycled here this year. Right. Yeah, it can be nice to know information and it can make for good pictures sometimes. But the people who cycle here regularly are not interested in that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. that much. But yeah. instead, we can choose whatever we want to show here. Like as you see, there's a sort of a slideshow here saying the old regional cycling brand over there. And it's also thanking you for cycling and walking and then displaying the top three of other counters as well. Fantastic. And I see a couple of uh, scooters uh, coming through. Uh, do you have oh, an yeah. indication or an idea as to how those are counted? I actually don't know yet. I'm as interested to find that one out because uh, the counters are based on induction loops and optical detectors and also shape recognition in some various places. It varies a bit depending on the location. Right. So if we are talking about the induction loops that is used to detect cyclists, it could as well detect the people on scooters as well. Right. Right. Fantastic. That's great. All right. Well, let's uh, yeah. let's go ride. Yeah, let's do that All right. with this wonderful bike of mine from 1952. So I it's only it. 70 years old. Oh, fantastic. What a classic. It is. It is. And it's a wonderful ride. Yeah, yeah. And is that a, a single speed or do you have gears on that? Yeah. Okay. Single it's speed. a single speed and coaster brake. So it's perfect okay. for doing rides like this. But I can just use my legs for braking and my hands are free for anything else. Right. So here yeah. you see the induction loops ah, embedded yes. into the surface. You see them here? Yes, sure do. And in addition, we have this small pole here that is an optical detector. So whenever someone passes here walking, 
it gives both signals and whenever somebody is cycling here we only get one signal so it's easy to differentiate with, between the two yeah it seems like you have to update your stencil there you had the uh, the parent uh you know walking with the child uh but you don't have a a, a person walking with the dog oh yeah indeed <laughs> but that means we would require quite a lot of different pictures then <laughs> <laughs> indeed Fantastic. So why don't you give a, a little bit of an introduction to, to what we're looking at here and uh, really the philosophy of how the walking and cycling network is is really organized in Oulu. Oh, yeah, that's important. So currently in Oulu, which is a city of about 210,000 people living here, and uh, currently we have about 940, 950 kilometers of totally segregated bicycle paths. Many of them are like these, so they are not even adjacent to any major roads. Some are, of course, following major roads and so on. But we have several direct connections from the city center between the city, uh, city suburbs and from the city center to districts and suburbs where you don't necessarily have to even cross a single road or very few ones that makes them really really fast effective safe and comfortable so they are really an alternative a real and alternative to other modes of transportation fantastic yeah and when when you look at the history of this network being developed uh what what existed before the, this time uh were, were these sort of like abandoned corridors or uh or what was the status of of most of these uh, cycle paths or or is it too varied to to you know to stereotype yes yeah, so i'm glad you asked so yeah uh the city used to be quite small until like 1950s 1960s maybe about 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people, I'm not sure. But as the city started growing rapidly in the post-World War II era, and our economy was finally recovering from the war times, uh, the city started growing rapidly and they understood that we need a traffic engineer here. And luckily they did chose a wonderful person for the job called Mauri Müllula who understood the importance of walking and cycling and what it means to our society, the well-being of, of us all. And that was a difficult task for him because 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s here were the era of strongest possible automobilization. He really did a lot of work to get our first bicycle master plan finished in 1971 or 1972. And he pushed through numerous underpasses under the highways that were built during that time and so on. And managed to create the ideas for those direct connections between the city center and suburbs. And that's when the basis for our bicycle network was laid. After that, uh, well, I would say that Every European city, most of the American cities, I guess, they used to be bicycle cities back in the history until the cars came and destroyed it all. Well, actually, we decided to destroy it all everywhere. But that same thing happened in Finland as well, a bit later, 50s, 60s, 70s, than what had happened in the US, for example, where it was like 1910, 20, 30s, 40s, 50s. But thanks to the dedication and that huge work Maori managed to do here, the tradition of cycling didn't die here completely like it did in so many other cities throughout the Western world. Yeah. And uh, there was a traffic survey made in 1962 in Oulu where the bicycle modal share was 42%. Okay. That would be a world record nowadays, I think, even higher than the Netherlands and so on. And that includes all modes of transportation, all trips and so on. And it's not just commutes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, naturally, we didn't manage to stop that negative progress here with motor vehicles totally. And the model share declined a lot. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. and we went down to like 19 to 20 percent where we still are at a different count say 19 some say 22 percent of all traffic made by bicycle which is still twice the national average and since we've had this uh bicycle tradition here like everybody's used to going to play going to places on a bike and it's nothing uncommon so that's helped it to be not a political issue right. and it's helped uh, helped uh, the planners in various stages of planners planning to understand that we really need really really need uh, good bicycle infrastructure good bicycle facilities everywhere when the city expands and when you're building new suburbs and it's always included in the city zoning plans and so on. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. But to add to that, in the 80s and 90s, even the beginning of 2000s, we really lacked ambition here in the city. So we were already the best city for cycling in Finland. Why should we do anything? Right, right extra for that i guess and that's how it feels at least so we kind of wasted 20 30 35 years that we could have used to build even better cycling city yeah yeah well and that's that 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 happens you know frequently is that you know mm-hmm. You get to a certain level and you you, you get a little complacent about it and it, you, that's why it's so important to continually uh, commit to uh, improvement and, and benchmarking and seeing what other cities globally are doing. So, yeah, yeah, I can see how that, that can happen. But uh, it sounds like you guys have doubled down in terms of trying to really uh, make cycling much more of a legitimate uh, form of transportation for everybody. Exactly. And uh, what is also an important point there is the winter. So we are at 65 latitude, so it's north, really north. I don't know, it's probably more north than Anchorage, is it, I guess? Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, uh, and, just, and just so the, uh, the audience knows, uh, towards the end, we're going to actually uh, pull up some uh, footage of the winter cycling. And uh, uh, Pekka has a wonderful um, YouTube channel with some, some videos out there. And, uh, and we'll also pull up his Twitter account, too. And, and it, I think even the cover photo of his, on his Twitter account is an amazing scene of winter cycling and the number of uh, kids that routinely ride their bikes to school. So, uh, so hold on, we're going to do that towards the end of our broadcast here today. Yes, we will. So, um, since we've had the tradition of cycling here always, uh, the bicycle pass has have always also been maintained naturally because people are moving about using their bikes. So why shouldn't they do that in the winter time? Right. And it actually like it, it blew my mind when I first learned it that some cities have bicycle infrastructure, but they do not maintain it in the winter time at all. Right. And in several Northern American cities, they've only recently started doing that. Right. It yeah. was really difficult for me to wrap my head around this thought. <laughs> Well, that's sort of the joke, too, is that, you know, the, the Dutch uh, are are just baffled by the fact that, you know, people from uh, other cities around the globe, North America and, and Australia, New Zealand in particular, you know, how fascinated we are with their situation. And since they just kind of grew up, especially if they, you know, grew up uh, relatively recently and didn't experience the 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 strife that happened in the 70s there uh they, they're they just you know like sort of fish in water they don't notice the fact that you know what they're in so yeah i can see how you would also be sort of baffled by you know other cities not maintaining their cycling infrastructure during the winter exactly yeah good stuff so yeah and and it also happens here that people do not understand that what yeah. we have here is actually quite special, even though it shouldn't be special. It should be the norm everywhere. Right. But it makes it, the, let's say that the international publicity that we've been finally getting recently during the last 10 years has really finally opened the eyes of local people right. to understanding how important and how wonderful it is, actually. And 
this is actually, I would say, this is much more amazing tourist attraction even. Right. Than any than anything else. Uh, every city has amusement parks and beautiful. Well, most many people have beautiful waterfronts and so on. But no city has this extensive cycling network, which is suitable for all ages, all abilities, even from the age of one or right. zero. Yeah, because yeah. people do go cycle with their newborns as well. Yeah. yeah. And also throughout the winter. And then also in the winter, you can go and cycle on the frozen sea, even if you want to. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, and it's just all a matter of your clothing. If you're, if you're properly attired, there you go. Yeah. And you don't need anything fancy. Right. Like Jason from Not Just Bike said that you need a jacket and you need a toque, as he said. We call it people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So that's basically it. So anything that you would put on put on when you go walking right. outside. And maybe yeah. even a bit less because you tend to get a bit warmer. Right, right. But so I wanted to show you this place here. As you've noticed, we are at a construction zone here. Right. So they are building a new bicycle superhighway here. Ah, okay. And look how wide it's going to be. Yeah. So that's 6.6 .6 meters. And to those not speaking metric, I think that should be like 22 feet. Right, right. Fantastic. And uh, for for those who, uh, well, or, or I should say, let's let's get your uh, definition of what uh, in Finland what a bicycle superhighway actually is. Yeah. So uh, we have the direct connections uh, from A to B as direct as possible, where we have separated bicycles and people uh, walking to their own lanes, and uh, we have four meters for bi-directional bicycle traffic on red asphalt. And then we have two and a half meters for people walking separated usually by a stone strip or, or a paint strip. And uh, always when just possible, we give that bicycle superhighway a priority in the crossings. And we tend to minimize the crossings so that in most major crossings we have an underpass or an overpass where we also try to minimize the height difference and soon we will see some of them let's go and find some yeah let's go do it uh and as you as you get on the bike and we uh we get underway uh talk a little bit about uh the topography of the area and i see that in these early stages we've seen quite a bit of water uh is is that a, a big feature in, in olu here at the waterfront, naturally. So we are at the Baltic Sea, the Bosnian Bay, which is technically part of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we are at the delta of Oluyoki River. So there's naturally a lot of bridges, but this is not anything like Netherlands and their canals. So this is probably the most Netherlands you'll see. Okay. okay. <laughs> but in addition to that, we are really flat. That okay. helps naturally. So oftentimes people say that, yeah, it's easy for you in Oulu because it's so flat here, flat over there, but wait until it gets hilly like in our city. But after the e-bikes, that argument is really thrown into the trash. Right, right. Yeah. Now, we just passed a, a, a parent with a child and and uh, and the parent, you know, had his uh, his uh, uh hand on on the back of the child and that reinforces that uh, the necessity for wide paths is because that's that's a mm -hmm. common thing uh that you'll see when you know out on the paths mm -hmm. and this particular path here is really really not wide enough yes i i, was, so I, it, I, I it, realized it, that but even then it was pretty it's like you know especially with north american standards you know folks are constantly <laughs> asking me well how wide should we make our paths and i says make them wide <laughs> you can't make them too exactly. wide so yes yeah basically you can't make them too wide <laughs> yes exactly well, technically, I guess you can. A hundred meters or something would be too much. Uh, yes, I guess, yeah, but. obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, describe what we're going through now. So, you're seeing some motor vehicles, and is this a shared street here that we're on? So, this is a pedestrian street where we only allow totally necessary car traffic. So, if you actually live here, okay, okay. Fantastic. And uh, this is still. One of the most stupid things that we have here 
in our city. So we have a major street here going through the city center mm -hmm. and cutting this pedestrian street here with traffic lights. Right. So there's, a, there's actually, at least in my opinion and after with my experience, there's totally no need for people to be able to drive through the city center here. And right. there, and it's not like this is the only option. There's two more streets where you can actually quite way, let's say, too comfortably drive through the city. Right, right. And the waiting time here is way too long, especially at this time of the day. It's sixteen twenty-five. Right. Yeah, it's just uh, it, it's unfortunate when cities have you know car traffic prioritized through the city center and mm -hmm. uh, and and it really becomes quite obvious when that occurs uh you know at these types of facilities whether it's a bicycle priority street or a a, a shared street you know type of situation mm -hmm. Yeah, it really sticks out like a sore thumb, as the saying would oh, yeah. go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is, uh, you got a bus crossing here. Yeah. And in this uh, situation, at this crossing, there were no signals, no traffic stops, yeah. no tra traffic lights there. Yeah, you should always avoid them if if it's just possible. Yeah. I also like this. You see the no bicycle sign here. Like <laughs> yes. you should, shouldn't park your bikes here, but people are just like, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. They're like, hey. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, people are going to be pragmatic, uh, you know, with these things. So, I mean, this is a great example, uh, you know, for businesses. If, if you really want to, you know, encourage, you know, people to to come to your facility you know make sure that you provide uh, appropriate parking and in you exactly know, in, a, in an environment where more and more people are wanting to ride bikes welcome those customers in and mm -hmm. that is the preference is is people who ride bikes you know to meet their daily needs and to do meaningful journeys they want to park out front of their exactly. destination as, as yeah. close as possible as close as possible and part of that is visibility too for the security of mm -hmm. of their their bicycle so that uh, it doesn't get lifted exactly yeah and way too often cities are trying to like minimize the distance of walking from your car right. to the shop yeah <laughs> and <laughs> yep. that's just nonsense it doesn't it just doesn't work well, and, and, and as we're going past a, a really, really crowded bicycle parking area here, and uh, and this actually has official racks in, in that particular location, it really mm -hmm. exemplifies, can you imagine if this was parking for this many cars? You just simply couldn't do it. It would This would be a massive expanse of asphalt for car parking. So that, exactly. that's the beautiful efficiency of the bicycle as a transportation uh, tool. Really ph yeah. phenomenal, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we do have car parking houses as well. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, um. But at least it was a facility, you know, can you, again, right, can you imagine like in North America, you know, at a grocery store or a shopping plaza area, that would be a massive expanse of surface parking. Uh-huh. And I can't understand how, how the, like the land is so cheap that you can still do that even in the downtown. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's baffling. And the, and the answer is in many attractive cities, uh, like Austin, Texas, where I'm located, uh, land is not cheap. And so it, it doesn't mm -hmm. pencil out. And so, for instance, in the downtown area here in, in Austin, uh, all of those old uh, surface parking lots are being redeveloped and turned into into housing and, and buildings. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. yeah. At least. Okay, so we're off of the shared street and going back onto a path. Yeah, we are. And we are heading away from the city center grid. We are still in it. 
and this is probably the worst time in terms of motor traffic but probably also the best time for bicycle traffic well I, I guess actually in the morning we would have even more more of that so here we have a kind of mock-up of uh, bicycle super highway beginning here so this is just retrofitted coating okay and this wasn't wasn't actually built originally to be like this but when we started building our bicycle superhighways, we actually, of course, we needed acceptance so that people understand what the bicycle superhighways are and what they will be before we start building them so that people will actually give us the budget to build them. Right. So we did a couple of examples like this in busy locations and where we could just to resurf resurface the path that was here already. Okay and point out the different lanes and people loved even this one even though this should be much wider and we should take like at least a lane away from the cars right but so this was a good example and uh, with the help of these and a couple of other locations we managed to get the acceptance and build our first first bicycle super highway along which we were in the very beginning of this recording right so as you see here it's way too narrow right so as as you continue to build out some of the newer facilities and more and more people start cycling again uh, yeah. what's the likelihood that you can uh redo this section and take a, a motor vehicle lane away well i wouldn't place my bets on that yet but i i don't think it's impossible at all mm -hmm. especially when the when, well, you know how the how urgently we should be redeveloping, refigure, like figuring out our cities completely again, with all the different megatrends in the world. Like we need to stop climate change and so on. So we yeah. really, really, really need to do that. Yeah, I mean, that was the thought that was coming to mind. I was thinking a little bit of uh, uh, Oslo and Paris and some of the big uh, cities that are. Are, are taking some bold steps to, to take away some of those lanes from motor vehicle traffic and or just mm -hmm. prohibiting, as you mentioned earlier, the fl easy flow of motor vehicle traffic and specifically internal combustion motor vehicle traffic in, in through the city centers. <laughs> it's easy for me to say, the city centers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. And... Uh... As of now, I'm really showing you basically the worst, worst that you can experience here on the bicycle with so many stops and so on. Right. But once we get past these traffic lights here, there are no more traffic lights uh, up, up ahead until like, let me think, like 35 kilometers for the first traffic lights after this one. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And... Uh, after this let's pass here so after this crossing here with the single car here so now there are no more level crossings with motor traffic for five kilometers not a single one wow okay and so really yeah that commitment to to doing underpasses high quality underpasses hopefully uh, so that you, you're not at the same level as the motor vehicle traffic. That's extraordinary. Exactly. And underpasses generally are much better than overpasses because you gain some speed and momentum on your way down, which, is, which then helps you to climb up from there. And you need to make them like, what is the opposite of steep? Uh, yeah, shallow. You you, you don't shallow, want yeah. Yeah, yeah you don't you don't want too steep of a a, a a descent and or ascent. So yeah, yeah, indeed. So it's as easy as that, and all the motor traffic has to stop there for red lights and so on. Right. So for example, this path it existed here already in seventies, part of Maori's great plan, but it was just a regular three meter shared pedestrian and bicycle path right. and just recently we've upgraded it as you can probably see here so it's quite comfortable now and as we are getting further we will get further away from that national main road 
So yeah. we are not being disturbed by that horrible noise from them. Right. Yeah. And of course, three meters is about uh, 10 feet. And what would you say the number of meters of this uh, uh, facility is now? It's 6.6. 6.6. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And that's about so 22 and feet. That's, yeah, that's exactly. It's about 22 feet. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it really feels quite comfortable uh, when you're when you're out there and clearly you can have, uh, you know, the, the bicycle traffic there and also uh, pedestrians have their space. Uh, it, do you see much in the way of conflict between people riding bikes and uh, people who are walking when when you have a facility such as this? No, not basically not at all. Yeah. And also the conflict, the amount of conflict is also pretty minimal, even on traditional paths, because so many people are already walking and cycling that it's nothing surprising to anybody. So everybody knows to expect that there will be people walking and there will be people cycling. Yeah. So even on those shared paths, people are, when they're walking, they are walking at the edge. Right. Uh, so they are not like blocking the whole path usually. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say that the the sort of approach to cycling uh, in this environment is uh, sort of, a, you know, more relaxed and easygoing uh, like it is, say, in Copenhagen or in, in the Netherlands? Uh, or is it a little bit more fast paced and, and needing to get from location to location like it typically is in, like, say, London or in North America or in Australia? Well, um, I would say that it's all of that. Yeah, a little bit of it. So we do have like the people who want to go, yeah, the people who want to go fast from A to B, A to B is some and lots of people who are just cruising about and uh, just cycling relaxed on a relaxed way yeah. from A to B and just going. Well, most people who are cycling here are actually going somewhere. So not that much of the bicycle traffic that we have here is purely recreational. Of yeah. course, we do have that as well, especially during the weekends. But you see that during the weekends, uh, the bicycle traffic numbers are actually much lower usually than during the weekdays so right. most of our traffic is actually commutes and people doing their errands and so on yeah yeah and it sort of makes sense too when when you're looking at an, a, a facility such as this where it looks like the distances are a, a little perceptually a little bit you know longer in length uh you, you're you're just you know you're you're moving quickly you're you may not want to just dawdle especially if it's a cold environment you want to keep keep your pace up a little bit so that kind of <laughs> makes sense yeah mm -hmm. yeah and this i i i'm in looking at this and experiencing this i get the sense that this is very applicable to many North American uh, cities, and uh, and I know uh, you know uh, across many cities in in Europe and uh, in in Australia, New Zealand, and and really you know probably just globally, where some of the distances are a little longer. Having facilities like this really makes it much more comfortable and feasible. Exactly. So when we've had some people let's say from North America to visit us and we go for a bike ride together and we cycle around aimlessly or not. And after the ride, I would ask them, how, what do you think, how many kilometers we cycled or how many miles because this, they are North American. So they usually, their guess is let's say that they guess that we cycled like 15 miles. Right. Whereas we, in reality, we did like 30. And they are all like surprised to how it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because it's so fast, so comfortable, so convenient that you don't even notice it, that you're actually covering a lot, quite a lot of distance. Right. So we just passed uh, several little junctions uh, or intersections, cycle path intersections mm -hmm. there, and we're seeing lots of signage. Uh, so walk us through sort of the, the wayfinding uh, approach that you have there in the city. Yeah, I should actually go a bit backwards then. Let's go back to the previous crossing then. Okay. So, and while we are here at a local elementary school, actually, 
Oh, wow. Fantastic. Well, so, uh, yeah. So all this of is, these. Yeah. Direct, direct access to the elementary school. And obviously, yeah, since and that, it's later in the evening, uh, the school's not in session right at this moment. Exactly. So there's nobody there now. And uh, well, this school actually also works as a community center. So there's a library and whatnot. Okay. So there might be some people there, but why would they leave their bikes this far away from the entrance? Because there's a, a lot of bicycle parking much closer to the entrance as well. But during the school days, you basically have to use these because there's just so much of it. Right. Yeah. And and this is extraordinary. I think this will really come to make more sense when we show some of the uh, the photographs and some of the video of the wintertime cycling of how the kids are able to use facilities such as this right to the doorstep of the schools. Yeah, exactly. So, so using this kind of network, which is mostly totally segregated from the motor traffic, means that most kids during their sc- school trip they either don't have to pass or cross any roads or very few of them. Right. Fantastic. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. Back to wayfinding. So recently, just a few years ago, we totally redesigned our guidance here. And uh, let's see if we found somebody here. <laughs> That's actually my colleague, Timo. Ah, fabulous. So this is uh, this kind of encounters you can do on a bicycle, you can do on foot, right. but you can't do that when you're using your motor vehicles. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> so hey, say hi, Timo. Hello. So Timo is my colleague, and he used to be my boss also, but no longer. <laughs> ah, okay, fantastic. Well, and well tell so, Timo uh, hello from uh, Austin, Texas. Hello from Austin, Texas. It's John Zimmer from, Zimmerman from Active Towns, and we are recording a video podcast here. And I was just starting to talk about signage and wayfinding here. Good for you. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. See you. See you. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a great guy indeed. So, together we have the craziest ideas, and we oftentimes try to also re- realize them. So, with him and a third person, we own a, our own small consultancy company called Navico. Oh, okay. Navico. Navico.fi. And uh, we try to do things differently, and we try to come up with uh, new and uh, even crazy ideas, like with creative madness, you could say. Right, right. Excellent. Yeah. So, but anyway, back to wayfinding. So, a few years back, we totally re- redesigned the wayfinding system. We did have a wayfinding system using those blue signs that you see there in the distance, mm-hmm. which was usable. I would maybe write, uh, rate it like five or six out of 10. Okay. Far from perfect, anyway. But we really needed to do something about that. So, during one year, we redes- redesigned the whole regional uh signage and as you can see here on this map so you can see the distance this is 25 kilometer radius from the city center 25 kilometers over there 15 20 and so on the city center is over there right yeah so we decided the main routes well we all already had kind of main routes here from one two three four five six seven eight nine eleven 12, which go clockwise, all the pink ones. And we installed signs from them, also adding this kind of metro style maps with the distances between different suburbs and so on. Right. So uh, along this path, you can cycle all the way to Mohos, 33 kilometers, and actually you can cycle even further than that. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we did install so-called advanced signs, which have always been there for motor traffic. Because uh, traditionally, you would only have these blue signs here at the junction, and you could even need to stop here and figure out where you actually want to go. Right. Because you can't read those from 200 meters away. Right. But let's go here and go a bit further away from this intersection, this junction on a, let's say, regular bicycle path here. Mm -hmm. 
and here we have one let's make a u-turn so always before those junctions we have these signs right so you can see the main route numbers in pink distances where to turn so you already know where you're supposed to go before you are at the crossing which is like it should be the basic minimum everywhere that you have these correct like yeah. you've always had for motor traffic yeah but during this one year project we installed like five thousand seven thousand signs in total wow that was quite a job quite a task yeah but now I would say that the signage system, I would give them nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, even in some places. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. So now that we're, we're on this, this cycle path, this is a super highway, obviously through here. Talk a little bit about, uh, the, the maintenance, uh, you mentioned the maintenance during the winter time. Uh, how does that happen and, and what sort of the approach to, to maintaining these facilities? Yeah, that is a really, really important point as well. So naturally, all the main bicycle paths and also the secondary bicycle paths are maintained during the winter time. So it's everything because we don't have a third class. <laughs> and uh, they, they are maintained throughout the winter. So whenever there's snowfall, they are being cleared. And uh, the traditional way for first class bicycle routes was so that in case of snowfall, if there's more than, if there's three centimeters of more, you need to clear that before 7 a.m. and again before 3 p.m. So before traffic peak hours, you need to have three, you need to have had them treated so that people can cycle all, all day around right. wherever they need to go. But, uh that wasn't enough so that would maybe give two or three plow rounds a day if if there's a lot of continuous snowfall and it, if it happened to be so that during the evening time there was a heavy snowfall the requirement was to only clear them by 7 a.m the next morning but if you're working late or actually you just have need to go somewhere during the evening it could create some problems for that also, traditionally, the contracting world here, or the winter maintenance world, the whole city area is uh, divided into 14 different areas operated by public and private companies. And uh, whenever you're going from A to B, you usually go from an area to another, or even through a couple of areas if you're cycling a longer journey. Right. And there could be a lot of quality variations between different areas because not every contractor is working at the same time or using exactly the same type of machinery or so on. And that would be problematic sometimes. So you couldn't really trust if the whole route has been maintained properly, even though you should be able to trust, trust that naturally. Right. So uh, about 10 years ago, me and Timo that we just met, mm -hmm. we came up with the idea of a super, super maintenance class where we would have regionally the most important bicycle routes from and to the city center and also the neighboring municipalities where we would only have those bicycle paths in the contract as opposed to uh, traditional contracts where you also have all the streets and so on in addition to bicycle paths. Right. But in this contract, we would only have the most important bicycle paths and uh, they would be treated as routes. So when they start from A, they will go through from the whole, through the whole route at one go. So we have like a route-based maintenance system. Right. In addition to that, we would uh, recruit voluntary maintenance agents who would ride them these routes on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. whether, whether they are commuting or not doesn't really matter as, lo as long as they are riding there. And they would rate the maintenance on a weekly basis. And the grades that they give to the maintenance would then directly affect, affect to the uh, pay of the contractor. 
Got it. So if the agents are happy, the contractor gets more money. Yeah, yeah. Now I see lots of uh, poles. Uh, are are those lights or are those uh, the 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 poles that uh, project the image down uh, during during the the heaviest winter fall when everything is uh, covered in in snow? So these are just lamps, yeah. Okay. And it's imp- and the good illumination is really really crucial because right. you know in the darkest darkest winter days we have like three hours of sunlight right if it's sunny and nineteen twenty hours of darkness fantastic and uh, then naturally now in the summertime we don't really need those lamps at all right right yeah yeah so so whenever I go riding my bike. Uh, I don't really need to take a lamp with me because the next time I'll be needing it, it's probably in September. Got it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, back to the maintenance still. Uh, important things in that is that we also tightened the quality requirements quite a lot. So nowadays there is 24 seven maintenance on the main routes. And whenever there's two centimeters of snowfall, it needs to be gone within three hours. Okay. And four centimeters must never be reached, reached at all. And the current contractor, Aulun Connect, they have done an absolutely fabulous job with that. Right. right. And uh, the customer satisfaction before this new contract model was around 3.5 to 3.7 on a scale of one to five, okay. which is already pretty good. It's much higher than the national average. Right. But now for the first winter, so two years ago, uh, their average grade, I think it was like 4.2, 4.3, right. I'm not sure, or mm-hmm. 4.4, I don't know. But that wasn't enough for them. So for this winter that just ended, they got 4.61. Okay, okay. On a scale of one to five. So I'd, uh, I'm just amazed like how they can even do that. Right, right. Very good. And here's a good uh, example of, you know, the, the older, the more narrow uh, pathways where obviously it's going to be shared between uh, pedestrians and people on bikes. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, what I wanted to say already earlier is that we are not some central European medieval dense city where everything is closed and it's just narrow cobblestone streets and so on. We are a car city. Right. We are sprawled. We are as sprawled probably than many North American cities and so on. So most of our cities are just single family housing okay, like these. Yeah. But there's a lot of difference in the layout and how we have the alternative options here. So we, you can actually cycle on paths which are comfortable like this, going through in between the districts and so on without the need to encounter too much car traffic. Yeah. And also a lot of those residential streets are dead ends for motor traffic, but not for people walking and cycling. So for example, here. Yeah. Which is crucial. And that's what this is right here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you want to access these houses with your motor vehicle, there's only one way to do that. Yeah. But if you want to cycle, there's like endless amount of options. Right. Because yeah. uh, it's actually quite rare to even find a street where you, which wouldn't be a dead end for people walking right. and cycling. Yeah. Well, it's a great I- example of how, you know, that particular land development pattern, uh, you know, that, that prototypical sprawled out uh, development pattern, how if you think about it ahead of time and create these networks of off street network of paths, you can create an environment which really does it you know encourage active mobility and yes the distances are are a little longer than uh say in a true dense in urban environment but it's incredibly comfortable to be able to uh you know be able to get on a bike and be able to walk or run in this type of uh, scenario it's it's a network of activity assets Exactly. And uh, let's imagine you live over there yeah. in some of those houses. You've got kids there and they want to go play with their neighbors who happen to live over there. 
Right. So that's just a direct bike path. They can walk, they can cycle. If you want to go there by car, I guess it's like one or two kilometers. Right. Yeah. So let's go here, for example, just out of spider and see what we have here. So it's a dead end for motor vehicles. Right. We're just entering it. And it's, there's no need for separate bicycle infrastructure here because it's, as you see, it's not too wide. It could be even more narrow in my opinion. Right. And it's a dead end. So you're, you're not really encountering too much car traffic. Right. And whenever we get to a collector street or something like that, there is already a separate bicycle path here like this. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, very, very, very simple. And and as you mentioned, you know, it, it's a, a slow street. Uh, and, and, and in that environment, what would be the speed limit for motor vehicles on the, that shared street environment? Obviously, it's 40 kilometers here. Uh, back where it was shared, uh, shared space, what was the motor vehicle speed limit in that environment? That would be 30. There you go. Right on cue. Exactly. <laughs> so even this old path here, probably built in 70s or 80s, is here in the, let's say, forest, just behind a residential area and an arterial street or road over there behind, which you barely even notice. Right. And will this path uh, get redone um, at some point in the future? I really hope so. Yeah. As you can see, the asphalt isn't that perfect. Right. But it's still totally cyclable. And so I think, well, here you see some damage yeah. already. Right. But yeah, we do have a lot of infrastructure depth here. Right. especially with bicycle paths. So many of the bicycle paths still have their original asphalt. Okay. That could be even from the 70s. Wow. Okay. Okay. But in some cases, it's still perfectly usable, right. which again, it can prove the point that <laughs> cars are even destroying the infrastructure built for them. Right. Yeah. Whereas good bicycle infrastructure can easily last 50 years. Right. Right without any kind of need for like yeah. structural maintenance. Yeah. And I did notice, uh, I noticed some of those cracks that you had pointed out there. Uh, so is there a, a maintenance program that somebody could call and say, Hey, we've got a pretty dangerous crack that needs to be taken care of. Yeah. And those, are like, uh, the cracks that are in the same direction as you are going, mm -hmm. yeah. they are like, I think they are the highest priority. Right. Yeah. To be fixed. Right. Yeah, those longitudinal cracks because you get your tire stuck in yeah. those and you're going down. Exactly. They are scary. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, they sometimes happen in our cold Arctic environment because you have the, I don't know what it's called, when the structure freezes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then melts. Yeah. And that melt. So on that particular uh, signal there, it was that optical yeah. where it was it able to pick up that those two were waiting? Yeah, it was able to pick up. It was actually three, not just two. Okay. I didn't. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a baby between the handlebars and the dad. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, she was. Yeah. I was. I, my view was blocked on that. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there are uh, induction loops as well embedded into the surface so that you can they can detect the people cycling. Fa fabulous, yeah. Like we have in most of our traffic signals, which makes it really effect effective and much less frustrating. <laughs> right, yeah, for sure. So now we are at a, let's say, totally lowest level of any priorities. We are on a cycle road that sometimes utilizes residential streets, which again are dead ends for car traffic. Right. But as you can see, 
the car traffic here is just absolutely intolerable. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's terrible. It's terrible. And and the the fact that, you know, the, the motor vehicle drivers are used to uh, encountering people who are walking and biking because obviously there's no sidewalks here as well. And so it, that 50, that uh, uh, 30 kilometers per hour limit, which again is in uh, imperial standards, is right around 15 to 17 miles per hour, is a very comfortable environment. It is. And um, having said that, it some places it should be even lower, like 20. Sure. Yeah. Understood. Especially if the if the volumes of of people are uh, you know, really dictate that that calmer environment. I totally agree. <laughs> that kid had a fishing pole with him. That's great. No, actually, it was a hockey stick. Oh, it was a hockey stick. Oh, I just caught a glimpse of yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. they were actually go, going to or coming from ice hockey yep. game or ice hockey training or something. Yeah. Let's go here. Let's go cross the river. We are now on the main roads, number six and 21. Okay. One of the most recent bridges, bridges over the river. And it's also for car traffic. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But the, but the path alongside it is, it's quite usable. Right. You have that nice physical separation making over the bridge. Mm -hmm. And here we and and I think this is this is great. Again, your your microphone is fantastic because it does cut out um, most of the ambient noise. But when the cars go directly past you, uh, we are get, getting a little bit of that noise. But speak a little bit to the fact that most of our route that we've been on today, you've been physically removed from motor vehicle traffic and. Uh, we, we can really only hear your voice. We can't hear a lot of extra uh, sounds. And I suppose when you're riding in a normal situation and you don't have your headphones on, you're, you're able to, you know, have a, a wonderful environment where you don't have a lot of external motor vehicle noise. Exactly. And it was actually now, even though I have like uh, these big headphones on, mm -hmm. it was difficult to hear what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Because of the motor traffic, so motor traffic noise. Yeah, yeah. So I can't wait until I get a bit further away from here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, yeah. It's one of the. I think it's you. More and more, we're starting to understand just how insidious uh, noise pollution is, and so when we can build our activity assets, when we can build our cycle and pedestrian networks away from motor vehicle noise, and you're able to actually hear nature and hear the birds chirping, it, it, it makes so much a, a difference. And in the winter time, you know, and, and snow helps muffle a lot of sound too. And being able to just like hear the environment is so incredibly powerful. It is, it is. I can't stress the importance of that enough. Yeah. So let's get somewhere away from that horrible noise. <laughs> as fast as possible. <laughs> exactly. That's great. So here. So yeah, this is a bike path. Okay. It used to be actually, I think like 50, 70 years ago, this used to be a national highway. Ah, okay. Yeah, and that was the, the, the we, we had to go around a barrier there. So that was clearly an indication to motor vehicle drivers to let them know, no, serious, this is not your road. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So this forest on our right hand side is empty, but you see the stone poles here mm -hmm. for the fence. Right. I guess it's an expansion ground for this graveyard ahead of us. Ah, okay. Got it. Yeah, this one. Right. Extension for future occupants. <laughs> exactly. 
So we do have streets and bicycle paths like this as well, where we have just barely separated the bicycle path from the street, either on one side or on two sides. And these are not the ideal solutions, especially winter maintenance wise, right. because you need to clear the snow away from the street, from the drive lanes. Where do you put it? Well, you have to push it to the bike path. And even though there's like a half a meter of brick layered surface there, it's not enough. So it needs to be cleared from the bicycle path again, uh, preferably immediately. Right. But it's sometimes really difficult to synchronize the machinery and the workers so that it would actually get cleared away right away. Yeah. Having said that, in that particular particular section, I have never experienced any problems. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we're coming up on some, uh, are these apartment uh, complexes here? Yeah, I think these are also single or double family buildings. Okay. Not sure. We can go and see. Yeah, as you can always go everywhere on your bike, right? Easily like this, right? Well, that's a that's a, a fabulous point there too. Is that you know there's just all of these uh, pathways connecting. They're integrated through the communities as well as uh, you know between communities. Exactly. Yeah. And we're getting closer to the river shore. Mm -hmm. to a location where we will build we will soon we will build a new bridge again over okay. the river and this one will be just for people walking and cycling no motor traffic okay and will that be an alternative uh route for people to to take so that they don't have to be next to the traffic yeah actually now that you say that i've never thought about it that way because uh you probably don't see it, but there in the distance, as far as I can now see, there's the next bridge okay. and we just crossed the previous one and they both are uh, divided the same way. So there's a path for people walking and cycling and then there's two lanes for motor traffic, Right. which might not always be the most comfortable choices. Right. But yeah, this one, which will be right around here, hopefully in a couple of years time, will be much more uh, comfortable alternative right well speaking about it and i know bridges are incredibly expensive to build um speak a little bit to uh the funding sources for for the cycle network and for bridges such as that where does this funding come from well <laughs> you could say shortly it comes from taxpayers and the state right but uh, building bicycle infrastructure and maintaining it the cost of that is it's just peanuts compared to anything but right. you what you build for motor traffic as you probably very well know and still of course we sometimes need to fight for some funding and uh, well whenever we build new districts new suburbs it's already included in the budget so there's no need to fight about that right in the integrated in the all stages of zoning and planning and the regional zoning and so on. It's there anyway. Got it. You want it or not. Yeah. But then for separate projects, like upgrading something to a bicycle superhighway, mm -hmm. because we are now retrofitting them mostly to existing environment. Whereas if it would be built somewhere, which is completely a new area, it right. would also be integrated in the planning and we wouldn't have to argue about that at all right. right but yeah still building a bicycle super highway costs something like four hundred thousand euros per kilometer okay so it's it's not that much so if you build like 10, 10 kilometers of that or let's say if you build five kilometers of that that's going to be like two million euros right. per year and that's basically nothing in the city budget. Got it. And so would you say that the, the majority of those types of projects and expensive projects like bridges are handled uh, within the city budgets? Or do you start to get a federal help or, uh, or funding from other sources? Yeah, we actually do get. There are some projects, uh, some programs where you can get funding for bicycle and 
cycling projects from the state. Okay. But they are the the funds are really small over there. It's like thirty million for the whole country. Uh okay. But you can get like fifty percent out of your costs from that budget. So when you're building like let's say a five million euro project, you can get like two point five million euros from the state. Okay. Which is a really good opportunity for the city. Right, right. Yeah. And we really, really, really need to boost that budget up right. from the state. Right, and right. I think for this year, it was actually, they did the complete opposite. Right. And they just gave like a few million euros instead of 30. Right. Yeah. And is there any any support that also you mentioned euros? Is there anything any support coming from uh, the European Union uh, sort of uh, approach, especially given uh, the commitment to climate change and and taking you know legitimate steps to move forward? Yeah, actually, now that you say about it, I had completely forgotten about it. So it is totally possible to get funding from the EU as well. Okay. I don't actually, myself, I don't know too much about that procedure, right. but every now and then you see like signs, info signs about some projects or like maps or tourist information points or some, somewhere over there. It says that it was funded partly by right. some European Union fund. Yeah. And I can see how that would really be uh, quite helpful, especially on those more expensive projects like bridges and, and like major uh, reconstruction uh, areas and superhighways uh, for, for cyclists. Exactly. Uh, a couple of maintenance vehicles there in the distance. Probably couldn't see them. Got it. Yeah. And we can see the bus you know, kind of pot passing by. And again, this is this is a great example of one of those streets where that winter maintenance challenge is there. Because like you said before, you know, when when the snow removal is happening um, and, and I, th I believe you had mentioned before that the there's a different uh, provider, a different contract between the road maintenance and the cycle path maintenance. Is that correct? Yes, for the regional main cycle paths. There is just one contractor that takes care in that contract only about the main, main bicycle routes, such as this one, where, what we are on right now, right. the route number five. Once again, one of our counters. Right. Yeah, so for example, in this case, when this contractor takes care only of this bicycle path, and then there's a separate contractor who takes care of the driver lanes. There could be conflict points there that the other contractor is pushing the snow on the bicycle path. And even though they are responsible of clearing the snow right away, so if you're pushing snow to bicycle path, you need to clear it away also, even if it's not your bicycle path. Right. But it's really, really difficult to control that. Right. <laughs> So this bridge, we're crossing the river once again, that was built in 1988. Okay. And again, let's go somewhere more comfortable. Yep. Let's go down here. So what do you think, John? Should we have some ice cream? Oh yeah, let's have some ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> Although yeah. I will, I, I will say it's going to be hot here. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna be uh, thirty eight degrees Celsius uh, today. So oh. uh, it, really, it's, it's really hot today. <laughs> wow, thirty eight. So that is actually just slightly over the all-time finish record which is 37.4 i think yeah 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 well it will be a record for today for us here too and it's very very unusual that we're this hot uh during may so yeah not, ex not really excited about that well. <laughs> yeah that's really scary as well yeah yeah for sure yeah, so we 
they seem to have a bit of a queue. I mean, it's on the positive side of zero. So yeah. it's not on the negative one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. And there's a beach, not too many people swimming right now, but yeah. I did actually go swimming uh, on Sunday. No, oh, okay. uh, Saturday, yeah. Okay. In a small lake which was not completely entirely frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so it was possible. So here's one thing that we have a lot. We have these trailers for kids. Right, yes. Yeah. Much more than any cargo bikes. So okay. cargo bikes have only gained popularity recently. Okay. We didn't really have we didn't really have too much of them here. Okay. But yeah, nowadays we have them, and but there's like thousands of those trailers, which are right. also really good for hauling your groceries. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it looked like that particular trailer was uh, one of those that converts. It could be, you know, you could push it as a pram or a baby yeah. jogger, and, and but then you could trailer it as well, so. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, here and here's Pekka getting his ice cream. <laughs> He's working hard, so we've got to get him fueled up here. All right. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. Looks like we have your yeah. ice cream. Yeah, we do. Uh, there you go. Let's go get some ice cream. And the requitos. No, I don't have enough hands. <laughs> All right. So what flavor did you go with? I would go with Patkis, which is a Finnish uh, mint chocolate truffle oh. brand. So yeah. this one. Yeah, looks fabulous. And tasty as well. Yeah. Maybe I should also now mute my mic so that you don't have to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. That's, actually, I can press pause too. So go ahead and enjoy and uh, it, let me know when you want to hit the, the, the start getting button again. All right, so you, you just had your your ice cream, and uh, we're 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 now in a in a new uh, view here. Uh, mm -hmm. What the heck is going on in this photo? In this photo, well, I'm transporting a couch that I bought from like the local equivalent of Craigslist. <laughs> I think I paid paid like twenty euros for that. And uh, if I would have used a car, I would have needed to rent a trailer and try to fiddle around with that car and trailer somewhere to get close enough to actually be able to pick it up. Instead, I could just take my 70-year-old cargo bike, ride <laughs> two, three kilometers to pick it up with a friend of mine, and then ride it back home with the friend who helped me to carry it sitting on the couch naturally. Yeah. She's not visible on this photo because she took the photo. Because she took the photo. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, well, welcome back. <laughs> it's good to have you back after uh, yeah. our short little break there. Uh, that was yeah. that was well timed. You needed to get some sustenance there and some ice cream and uh, uh, exactly because after all, it's uh, it's plus six at least here. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you need to pace yourself. <laughs> So yeah, exactly. one, one of the things that we wanted to do as part of uh, this broadcast of this recording is uh, to to bring in some of the uh, the content that you have created 
including out on your YouTube channel. And so uh, I've got your YouTube channel uh, pulled up here and uh, we, we can take a look at it. And I love the cover image on your YouTube channel, which is you know the, all the, the, the bike parking uh, at that local school there. And we talked about it earlier in the, in the recording that uh, the, many of these schools are served by these separated paths that make this level of bike to work possible. Talk about that and, and how incredibly you know powerful that is for the kids. Exactly. So as you said, most of the schools, I would say every single one of them is served by extensive, vast bicycle path network, which is safe for the kids to use. Right. So oftentimes it could be like in this case, in Metsokanga school, located about eight to ten kilometers from the city center, okay. in a car centric single family housing dystopia, that uh, <laughs> you can access it from every possible direction fast and effectively by bike right. or, by, or by foot or sometimes even skiing. Right. And uh, with a car, you need to take a longer detour. And it's just not comfortable or not even applicable. applicable. Right, Can't right. even say that word. Yeah, applicable, uh, yes. <laughs> to most parents. Right. Yeah. 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 And I also wanted to say about this very photo is that this is only one of the four parking lots of the school. Oh, my gosh. Really? Wow. Yeah. Fabulous. Also, it was, also it was taken at like 8.40 a.m., Mm -hmm. So many of the students haven't even yet arrived. Okay. Some start okay. their school at nine or 10. Right. Right. What would you say to the fact that, you know, many parents in, in other countries, other societies just feel like, you know, that's, it's too cold and, and, and kids can't possibly ride to school and, and that sort of weather. Uh, clearly they can. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't, I don't really know what you can say to that uh, because it's so absurd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Kids, kids love to do that. Yeah. Like, for example, we, uh, I was talking with a French, French journalist who came to make a story about this very school and cycling in Oulu. Yeah. So we spoke with this one family who had recently moved from France to Finland to Oulu. Yeah. Actually, because of their love for the local heavy metal music, they were huge uh -huh. fans of some local bands. Okay, okay. And uh, they settled for Oulu, and their small kid, kid Dana, I think, I think she's like six, seven, eight years old, something like that. And they were th they were thinking that parents that she, they, for the winter they would just take her to the school by car. Right. But she didn't want to. Right. She wanted yeah. to cycle because it was so fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also everybody else did that. And everybody else does that. And I guess that's that's part yeah. of it, right? I mean, uh -huh. we're, we're such a herding species. If we're seeing all of your peers doing it this way, I mean, of course you're gonna. Yeah. Of course you're gonna ride. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It makes makes sense uh, to me. <laughs> and once it, you you just need the infrastructure and you need the maintenance. Right. That's it. Yeah. 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 Such a good point. So I'm going to, I actually want to press play on one of these videos here. I'm going to pop on over to your, the, the best, uh, winter cycling. So you're, this is the, the bike busters is, is that a, a branded, uh, you know, sub theme or a sub channel to your channel? So it was actually, a, like a brand or an initiative to bust cycling myths like oh. you can't cycle in the winter right and uh, we use that also to challenge some local politicians right to cycle cycle there some of their daily commutes or so by bicycle right 
And so, so we this have is a, some this of those a, videos as well. I love this video here, and because it, this is a great video, you go into detail about the the maintenance, uh, you know, contracts and and how the the approach to the maintenance. And you've got some nice footage here of of some of the maintenance uh, happening. And you saw the kids in those opening shots; they're riding on the cycle pass, and. Um, it seems, it, it, I understand there's a difference between the treatment that takes place during the freeze and thaw period and where, where it gets, the, the snow gets slushy and, and, and you would actually remove everything from the, the path versus the, the time when uh, the hard pack. So in the heart of winter, there's something called hard pack and uh, t- describe that that concept because that that in North America, you know, we may never get to a hard pack. It may get scraped all the way back down to the the asphalt surface. Yeah, because you destroy everything with salt. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, destroy everything with salt. Yeah, just not not just the good surface, but you destroy the environment and right. yeah. dogs' paws and. Uh, the aquatic life and so on. Not, don't get me started on that yeah anyway so um as you saw in the video we are mechanically plowing the snow away right and as you can see also a little bit of that is left on the surface so a little bit of that every time it's plowed accumulates into a very very hard packed good snow layer on top of asphalt right. it could be anything from a couple of millimeters to like dozens of centimeters right it could be but it must not be too thick got it so we are not actively creating it it's kind of a byproduct but it happens to be a really good surface to cycle on right when you are making it with a blade which you will probably see later in the video i can't even remember it myself but the blade has really tiny tooth carbide metal tooth teeth right that has like grooved ridges the teeth are spaced like 16 millimeter apart right and it creates totally enough friction right for just regular summer tires so you don't even need to study tires to cycle on that surface See, this, is and, fa- uh, this is so fascinating yeah. because a lot of people would like freak out and say oh i need to get studded tires but because of the treatment and because of those little grooves it becomes a grippy surface and so you can just r- run your normal tires exactly it's just whatever it's on your tire uh, on your bicycle already just Fantastic. use them then again if you want to use study tires and you think it gives you some extra comfort comfort and you feel more stable or more reliable or something like that right with them just just go for it anything that makes you cycle use a fat bike use an e-fat bike if you feel more comfortable doing so right. anything yeah but you don't need to do that right so right. if you if you need to use study tires if you need to use fat bike to go from a to b in the winter time the winter yeah. maintenance has failed right right yeah so that's uh, i'm so glad we were able to pull this video up and and get a visual because it's you know it's one thing to see it in the summertime as we're riding we're talking about <laughs> it but to, to see that that winter maintenance happening and and here's the 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 uh the the treatments and you're you're working on that process of you know that hard pack and uh and it's just it's so empowering to see because so many winter cold cities just assume that people won't ride but clearly if you have a safe network and then you have a dedication to proper maintenance and creating a path where it's not too thick and you've you've got a layer where it's not too slippery and and becomes black ice then it's it's so empowering to know that yeah no we can we can jump on our bike and go Exactly. 
And yeah, we do have a lot of variable conditions and people are oftentimes saying that you have such a good winter that it's just stable and stays below zero all the time. So it's easy to maintain. Yeah, that helps. Sure. But especially in the early winter, late spring, we have the freeze and thaw cycles like every day, every freaking day. Right. So it's just that we have those conditions just during a different different months than you may have. Right. So we do have that. About the uh, hardback snow layer, as I'm describing in the video, the layer needs to be kept thin enough so that when we have the thaw cycle coming, and it melts, it's really easy to scrape off or even keep it as thin as a couple of millimeters. So when it softens, it's no trouble to cycle on at all. And it might not even need any maintenance. Right. Might also just completely melt away. Right. Right. Yeah. Good point. And I do get the sense, too, that uh, that people in general, you know, that are cycling on a regular basis there, uh, they, they kind of roll with it a little bit. I mean, like you said, you know, especially in those shoulder seasons, you know, the spring and, and the fall, you may have uh, variable conditions and it's not it's not the st stability that you have in the summertime and it's not necessarily the stability that you have in the dead of winter. Uh, and I, I, I get the sense that, you know, just like the kids are like, cool, this is fun. Let's ride to school. Uh, you, you guys are like, yeah, whatever. It might be icy. It might be slushy. It might be you know, whatever. Let's just go. I mean, that's my impression. Yeah. And then exactly. But I have to say to that, that if it is icy, we do have icy conditions as well. Yeah. Then we just add a little layer of sand or gravel there, like really tiny amounts of it just to add enough fr friction. Right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that it will be safe even with your summer tires. Yeah, yeah. And earlier we talked about stu studied tires and uh, studied tires are basically horrible for everything else except plain ice. Right. On plain ice, they are totally unbeatable. They are really good on really, uh, if, if the ice is slippery and especially if the ice is wet. But for anything else, they are usually horrible. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you glad you mentioned that. And <laughs> you certainly don't want to be running studded studded tires when you've got, you know, cleared pathway. That that would be miserable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well I, I won't say it's miserable. It's totally rideable then again, but it's just extra trouble for you to change them or have them changed and so on when you don't usually need them. Of course there can be situations where they can help. Yeah. And as I said earlier, if you feel more comfortable using them, go ahead. I'm, I don't want to shame you. Right, right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Definitely, definitely yeah. not. As long as you're riding, I don't care what, yeah. what you're using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your point is well taken that, you know, it, it's having the right tool for the right condition. And if you're freaked out about something and you go with studded tires and then you're in an environment where you don't need studded tires, you're going to lose your confidence because it's not going to be a good ride. Well, Pekka, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you would want to really sort of leave the audience with as we, we, we close it out here? No, that's a good question because there's so much things that you understand only when you actually come here and yeah. cycle yourself, be it during the winter or be it during the summer. Yeah. Well, and what's great, and I do encourage everybody, be sure to check out uh, you know, Pekka's channel. It's it's just absolutely amazing. And uh, and there's so much content out there. And uh, and I love that you have that whole series about, you know, you know, busting those myths that, that you know, that are, are persistent out there. And I look forward to visiting. You know, I, that's, yeah. I, I'm shooting for uh, 2023 to be a much longer European trip. Um, this this year, I'll be trying to make it out, like I said earlier, uh, for the International Cargo Bike Festival at the end of October in the Netherlands. But it's a quick trip. I'm in and out. Uh, but next year, uh, I need to have a, a repeat of my 2015 trip when I spent uh, over a month in or just about a month in um, in the in the in Europe, traveling to multiple countries. So uh, 2023, Finland is now officially on my list uh, of places to visit. Yeah, so that's a done deal. 
So, and it seems like we have again a soccer game, game here. Oh, good. It's just absolutely jam packed here. So, let's go see what the counter says now. Okay, We cool. began our recording session today at this same counter. Let's go see what it says now. I, I don't honestly remember what it was showing when we started. I think yeah. it was maybe 1800 or something. Correct me when I'm wrong. But now it says 2600. Fantastic. Yeah. So 1800 people, 800 people cycled here yeah. during the, during our recording. Doing, doing our little recording. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it has been such a pleasure to, to get to know you and, and spend a couple of rides riding with you. Uh, we also uh, did a session on Friday. So some, some of this may, may include that, uh, some footage from that because we went over to the university. Uh, thank you so very much. It's been such a joy having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs>